right. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone from all around the world. We are very pleased to welcome you today to discuss adapting child protection case management to the COVID-19 pandemic. We will have the pleasure to welcome diverse perspectives throughout this webinar, as well as there will be some opportunity to Q&A. But before we start, as the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action, which is an interagency network of almost 100 members working on responding to child protection in emergencies, we have started to work on how to respond to child protection and COVID-19 pandemic since March, with as well the publication of a technical note that was released on the 16th of May and which has been translated so far in 18 language. This technical note is meant to be a live doc, a living document and we will, and that's why you see V1 on your screen because as long as we learn, as more as we learn from this unique situation, we're trying as well to make sure that what we are producing as the Alliance match the needs that you have from the field. You can find the technical notes as well as over other annexes on the Alliance website, which appears on your, on your screen. We have as well, based on your feedback, developed quite a few annexes and case management is, is one of them. For the people who, who may know, there was a, a recent UN report policy brief on children and COVID-19, which really outlines clearly that this pandemic is becoming a child right crisis. And therefore, the case management is more than ever a critical service to ensure that vulnerable children have access to protection services. So I am very happy to hand over to my dear colleagues today to discuss with you how we could respond and adapting case management in time of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for finding the time to visiting today's webinar, the first webinar in a series on adapting case management during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Zainab Hijazi. I'm the Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Specialist at UNICEF based in New York. I also co-lead the Case Management Task Force with Crystal Stewart from IRC, who was unable to make it to today's webinar. But really, today's webinar is a symbol of the Case Management Task Force success because it was almost entirely designed and organized by its active members. So thanks to Plan International, UNHCR, IRC, RC, UNICEF, Save the Children, and TDH for your support in putting this webinar together. The program for today will start with a segment titled Voices from the Field, with three field presentations from Lebanon, South Sudan, and Cox Bazar. We will have a Q&A session at the end to answer questions you might have for the presenters. In the second segment of the webinar, the Case Management Task Force members will provide an orientation on the content and the use of a COVID-19 child protection case management guidance that we have been working on within the task force. It was recently developed and the field test version will be received by you in the chat box and at the end of today's webinar in a follow-up email. We will also have a Q&A session at the end of that orientation to answer questions you might have about the guidance note. We will conclude the webinar with a live poll, an exercise that will enable us to establish with you a set of priority topics linked to child protection case management and COVID that require support and understand, really understand better from you the modalities for addressing these priority areas that best meet your needs while ensuring accessibility and quality. Remember, before we start, we will send you all the relevant links after the event, including a link to the webinar recording and the COVID-19 child protection case management guidance that you'll be hearing about today. Now we can begin. Our first speaker is Rita Flora Cavorquian with UNHCR. She's the Associate Protection Officer. I'm delighted to be connected with Rita after working very closely with her in Lebanon many, many years ago. Rita, over to you. Hi Zainab, it's good to see you. And hi everyone. To start with, I really would like to thank you and, and the colleagues for giving us the opportunity to provide updates around remote case management with children uh, during COVID-19 pandemic. My presentation today is going to be divided into two parts. During the first part, I'm going to discuss about the key uh, protection issues that refugee children are facing. And during the second part, I'm going to focus my presentation more on provision of remote case management, focusing on good practices and, of course, on, on challenges that, you are, uh, that we are facing. So to start with the first part, I think, I believe it is important to note that 
54% of the Syrian refugee population known to UNHCR Lebanon, they are children. And among them, 43% are considered at risk, including out of school children. The main key child protection issues that we continue facing in Lebanon, among many, are the issue of child labor, which continues to be underreported. In Lebanon, we do not have a national study which provides a clear baseline of, uh, about this problem. Child marriage, particularly targeting uh, adolescent uh, girls, as well as increased domestic violence is also being observed. Families are reporting tension, particularly because of degrading socioeconomic situation in the country. So basically, Lebanon is living one of its worst economic crises. By today, our currency has devaluated 50%, which is also which is affecting Lebanese, but even more refugee communities. Parents are reporting that they are unable to control themselves. They are very aggressive, very tense all the time, and this is negatively affecting children. There is the problem of lack of appropriate alternative care for unaccompanied and separated children and children at heightened risk. And of course, there's an increase of street-connected children because parents are not working, children are not going to school, and eventually, unfortunately, they are being more and more engaged in, with street-related work. Exacerbated by COVID-19, child protection caseworkers are finding it very challenging to meet the needs of families due to the absence of increased services of food provision. And particularly when it comes to refugees in Lebanon, they are facing immense restrictions on movement and access to services. I repeat, access to services, because local communities have concerns that refugees are going to transmit COVID-19 outside their communities. And they're also increasingly facing risks of eviction. A problem that existed since a very long time, the shelter issue, particularly during, during COVID-19, there are no shelters in Lebanon that are accepting refugee children due to fears of transmission of, of COVID-19. However, in parallel, with thanks to the alternative care project that uh, UNICEF is leading in Lebanon, we are trying to find solutions through family-based care, etc. But the problem is still there. Uh, all these protection problems combined with some contextual factors that it is important that I mention is that unfortunately in Lebanon, we have weak national child protection system and welfare systems in general. The country is in a difficult situation. There are gaps and challenges related particularly to legislation and policies on child protection. And there's inconsistent implementation across the country of these policies. What, what is also not helping us a lot is that funds are decreasing for, for child protection case management. And we know very well that according to case management minimum standards, every social worker can take up to a certain number of, of cases. And therefore, this is also uh, not helping us a lot. And this also pushes us to re-emphasize the need that all child protection case management actors, we need to work together to cover, uh, to cover uh, these, uh, these gaps. Moving now to the second part around remote uh, case management uh, with uh, children. In order to adapt to the COVID situation, remote case management is currently taking place through phone via WhatsApp. Some agencies continue to receive cases in their centers. However, the government has requested all to cease presence in the, in the field. We know very well that this modality has been helpful, but it also has its limitations, which I'm going to explain uh, later on. It is important to note that case conferences uh, are still uh, happening and uh, best interest determination panels are still operational, all of them uh, happening online. To keep ourselves honest, we know very well that some children don't necessarily have mobile phones or maybe they, they were unable to renew their bundles, so it's not, they're not easily accessible. Staff are less remote, our outreach volunteers are, are rest, less remote, so there's a need also for some cases to define with which cases we still need to do the face-to-face -face sessions. So exceptionally, these face-to-face -face are taking place exceptionally with high-risk groups such as unaccompanied and separated children and treat-connected children. And we're also considering extending such cases to include children expressing suicidal ideation, those who have experienced sexual assault, those who are experiencing extreme physical violence and they are at risk of trafficking.
one one element that it's particular for the Lebanon operation, which which helped us to survive a lot, is basically we do have a very very active community groups. We have a very active uh, we have very active child protection outreach volunteers who were who some of them were basically trained to provide support to unaccompanied and separated children. So through them as well, we're trying to maintain certain level of contact with with our PG children. Of course, we are also trying very much to train newly recruited health workers and community groups who are being mobilized, particularly to respond to COVID-19. So all of them are being trained on safe identification and, and, and referral for child protection cases, including other, other cases as well. So as well, we have tried to expand hotlines for health case referrals, including for uh, child protection. And this is being coordinated through the very active National Case Management Task Force and the case management working groups, and whereby we have split the responsibility across six agencies in the country who are all of them supporting the identification and the referral and, and proper distribution of, of cases. As part of the, and as well, I mean, in order to ensure quality provision of remote case management, the National Case Management Task Force, which is led by IRC and Save the Children, supported in developing four guidance, four guidance notes together with the core group members. I don't want to forget uh, anyone. There's UNICEF, there's Himal, UNHCR, Save the Children, IRC, etc. And these guidance uh, notes have helped a lot all uh, case workers, all child protection agencies to use the same messaging, the same methodology, as well as to ensure some consistency in the quality of uh, case management that we are delivering. Also, if we think about case management, I believe it's very important to look at it holistically from the identification to the assessment, to the referral, as well as to the provision of services. The PSS activities are still ongoing for children, but of course it's happening remotely. And if the child happens to be in the center, it is happening while ensuring respecting precautionary measures. Delivery of protection cash and emergency cash is also happening and we are reconsidering a little bit the amount, as I said, given the, the devaluation of the, of, the, of the Lebanese pound. Also, one very important project that we have with IRC, and it's well known, I think Colleen knows the best because she was part of starting it up in Lebanon. This is a coaching program, an interagency coaching program funded by UNHCR, whereby trainings are and coaching, online coaching and trainings are being provided to child protection agencies in order to ensure that all of us adhere to the same uh, standards. And, and the, the, the interagency coaching program, it also provides, if you want a safe space for case managers and case workers to express their concerns, where do they need extra information and extra, extra support. The child protection coaching program, which is established since 2013, is it used to happen face to face but now it is uh, happening uh, online and over the past four weeks it's important to mention that over 219 child protection case workers from judiciary from uh, the ministry of social affairs from national and international ngos all of them have been trained with thanks to irc and it and its uh, expert colleagues and basically we are planning to move this this type of support a little bit uh, further uh, forward one important thing which I also believe it's, it's we need to mention is for the different sectors, it's very important that they, that they listen to the child protection case workers and they listen and get their feedback in the relation to access to services. Because sometimes from the sectors, they don't know what are the challenges that children are facing. And also it's the other way around that we do not know particularly how programs are, are, are changing and how can we benefit the most to support, uh, to support children. Again, at the, at, the, at the end of my presentation, I would like to emphasize uh, and, and express gratefulness for the very active child protection working group and the case management uh, task force and the core group, because really in Lebanon, all of us are working uh, together to address child protection issues and of course to address COVID-19, which gave us a very important lesson that we need to be coordinating more and more to have a better, to provide better services for those who need us the most. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. We've all been looking at Lebanon's adaptation of child protection case management for guidance and we're grateful for your clear layout of both 
what can be done to ensure continuity of essential services, but also the challenges that persist in such a challenging context. A reminder to everyone, if you do have any questions during the presentation, just to write them in the Q&A space that you, you can see at the bottom of your screen. We will be answering all questions at the end of the three presentations. Our second speaker is Thomas Fedlu with the International Rescue Committee. He is the Child Protection Coordinator. Thankful to have you with us and presenting your field level challenges and experiences in South Sudan. Thank you very much, Zainab. I'm Thomas Fedlu, a Child Protection Coordinator from the IRC South Sudan Country Program. Thank you very much uh, for giving me this chance to share the IRC South Sudan case management adaptation in light of COVID-19. I would also extend my acknowledgement to the IRC Child Protection Technical Coordinators, South Sudan Child Protection Subcluster and Technical Working Group lead who contributed to this presentation. My presentation will focus on three issues. The first one is the context, COVID context in South Sudan. The second one is South Sudan Interagency Case Management Guidance to COVID-19. See case management adaptation to COVID-19. When I start the first topic, the context in South Sudan, as you all know, uh, South Sudan have been passed uh, through a different uh, contextual challenge. South Sudan has experienced a high level of violence and unrest. There has been mass displacement, loss of livelihood, destruction of housing, human rights abuse, including gender-based violence and the recruitment of children uh, for armed group. Currently, according to the HNO 2020, there are uh, an estimated 2.5 million children and caregivers are in need of child protection service in South Sudan. Africa is predicted to be the next, the next epicenter for COVID-19. You can imagine how the country like South Sudan can be affected, which is the least prepared according to the Global Health Security Index classification. South Sudan reported its first case of COVID-19 on April 5th, and four cases are now uh, confirmed. At country level, the high-level COVID-19 task force is leading the response, which is currently being led by the, Republic, the President of the Republic of South Sudan, being supported by the National COVID-19 Steering Committee, the Ministry of Health. There are uh, UN agencies, INGOs, and national NGOs who are contributing to this uh, effort. The government has been taking multiple uh, prevention measures to mention some international flights are suspended and all uh, borders are closed, domestic flights and uh, public transport, interagency movement, interstate uh, movement is suspended, with some exception for humanitarian actions, and UNAS, uh, which is a WFP flight, is serving at half uh, capacity. Schools are also closed. About 1.9 children, uh, 1.9 million children whose education is disrupted. Non-essential government employees have been directed to work from home, and public transport is working only at a half capacity. These are a few of the measures are taken just to save our time. When I come to the interagency case management effort, the South Sudan. Child Protection Subcluster, which is currently uh, being led by uh, UNICEF, is coordinating the Child Protection Subcluster member organization to prepare and respond to the child protection risks uh, during a COVID-19 pandemic at the national level. The, they have also organized an online and face-to-face -face, uh, training on COVID-19 prevention and risk communication pillar, which is attended by 35 member organizations. There are four child protection technical working groups under uh, this child protection subcluster, child protection case management task force, an accompanied and separated working group, PSS uh, working group, and CAFAG uh, working group. All groups uh, meet monthly. In COVID-19, they have uh, adapted to an online meeting. Uh, all of the working group are uh, planning to conduct their second meeting uh, during this week, almost the three of the working group meeting have uh, almost uh, conducted. The subcluster also produced a general child protection COVID-19 guidance note and also updated the referral pathways. They shared a reporting template to document child protection response uh, to COVID. As part of this effort, the case management 
task force, which is currently being led by UNICEF and co by Save the Children. They have also created a case management guidance for COVID-19 response. The lead has prepared this guidance and members have also contributed their inputs and it's uh, already endorsed and uh, members starting implementing this guidance starting from today. This task force also revised the case management SOP and alternative care guideline to respond to all infectious diseases, but we have agreed that it needs a further revision uh, in, line, uh, in the lens of COVID, so the activity is already started. The case management training was conducted by the task force previously, but there will be a refresher training based on, on the revised uh, guidance. The unaccompanied and separated children uh, working group is currently being led by Save the Children, co by UNICEF. They have also created a guidance for COVID-19 response. It's uh, shared for member for action. The FTR activity is being continued for the high-risk cases on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Around 31 uh, partners are uh, active member of uh, are actively engaging in the FTR activity. Currently, some uh, FTR activities are ongoing. Generally, in South Sudan, the child protection and case management funding is reducing, though uh, the child protection risks are increasing. When I come to the third, the IRC uh, program uh, adaptation, IRC has. Uh, categorize South Sudan at uh, level four, which is the uh, response phase. In this phase, RC has adapted the child protection program to respond to case management as a life-saving intervention. So COVID-19 response in view of the following uh, adaptation. RC identified high risk cases from uh, the existing case load, uh, which is around 40% uh, of the cases are identified. New cases are being uh, identified using uh, the national case management uh, prioritization matrix, but focusing on the high risk cases. Case workers, community based child protection network members, and uh, child protection help desk focal points have also been trained on prevention of COVID, PFA, and case follow up. Uh, the location where IRC is operating has a telephone service, uh, has, uh, has not a telephone service, so uh, remote support is a, a challenge for our case. To adapt our program uh, to this context, our case workers are the ones who are uh, managing the case follow-up face-to-face. They will go to the individual house, but they will stay outside on the open air to avoid the physical contact and maintaining social distance. IRC has uh, embedded its child protection program in different sectors like education, health, and nutrition, and established a child protection health desk. Uh, currently, schools are closed. We only focus on the two facilities. So child protection health desks uh, at the health and nutrition facilities, adapting services to respond to uh, high-risk cases identified through the facilities. When it comes to the risk communication, in some of uh, the locations where IRC is operating, there is no a radio bro uh, broadcasting uh, service. Our care workers and community-based child protection network members are engaging in message dissemination using a megaphone announcement with support of the health team. The IC materials displayed in the community, different corner of the community, as well as health facilities. When I come to the FTR activity, currently IRC is supporting around 12 children with a high risk level. Two of the children uh, will be reunified with, the, with their parents by the next week with support of Save the Children and UNICEF and other partners. The remaining cases are at the documentation stage. Uh, this is all uh, that uh, have. Uh, thank you very much for your interest and attention. If you have any questions, you are welcome. Thank you, Thomas. Um, really an important example of how an already struggling community in a humanitarian context can be particularly affected by further disruption to their lives and routines and putting them at additional child protection risks. Uh, we look forward to learning more from you, Thomas, and the interagency work that IRC is contributing to in South Sudan. Our thank final you, speaker in joining us is joining us from Cox Bazaar, Maya Bulos with TDH. She is the Bangladesh Cox Bazaar Child Protection Coordinator. Um, thank you for being with, with us today to share your experiences and lessons learned. Floor is yours, Maya.
Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. I will be presenting on behalf of TDH and the Case Management Technical Working Group in Cox Bazar on the key and unique challenges and strategies for case management in the Rohingya refugee response in the context of COVID. As you may know, there are approximately 900,000 Rohingya refugees in what's been deemed the world's largest refugee camp. Among them, a significant number of persons with specific needs and women and elderly head of households. Over half of the refugees are children, a quarter adolescents who now face heightened child protection risks and restrictions during COVID that we'll examine in the next slides. The situation in the camp is already difficult with a very high population density that makes it very difficult, if not impossible, to self-isolate or practice social distance adequately. Hygiene levels are often poor due to limited access to water or wash services and facilities. And health conditions are sometimes also concerning with respiratory illnesses and malnutrition being concerns even before the disease outbreak. To make matters worse, the cyclone and monsoon season has just started, increasing the risks of landslides and floods in an already difficult environment. And finally, in terms of the humanitarian space, restrictions in telecommunication, particularly in mobile and internet coverage, which is almost absent in the camps, has, we're going to see has had a lot of consequences on our ability to respond. Refugee status is not recognized and there is a lack of access to livelihood with a lot of movement restrictions, both within and outside the camps. And finally, for children currently, learning facilities are closed with uh, little options for home-based learning. I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of the progression of the response, uh, beginning on the 17th of March, when the Humanitarian Response and Government of Bangladesh released a COVID preparedness and response plan that prioritized health, wash, and communicating with communities. One week later, the first case of COVID is confirmed in Cox's Bazar, and the response issues a guidance on safe access to the camps, while most actors begin to shift to remote work, particularly for non-field staff. At this point, the Protection Working Group also releases a matrix listing essential, critical, and possible activities under lockdown. The second day, we move into the essential stage, which for child protection means that case management can continue, while psychosocial support and sensitization and information sharing move to an individual door-to-door -door modality versus group-based modality. The child protection sector begins to shift to more mod remote modalities of implementation, and child protection field presence is reduced to half of our capacity. One week later, on the 8th of April, uh, the government of Bangladesh declares uh, that we've entered critical stage, and the overall humanitarian footprint in the camps is reduced significantly. The protection presence is further reduced, but we still have access. And case management currently can continue with adjustments to our modalities that focuses increasingly on volunteers. What are the child protection risks and vulnerabilities that we're seeing on the ground? Similar to what my colleagues mentioned, we're seeing with lack of education and uh, psychosocial support, as well as measures like quarantine, isolation, and community shielding, an increase in tension and stressors in the home that are likely resulting to a higher exposure to violence. Reports are already showing anecdotal evidence of increase of specific child protection risks, such as accidents, violence in the home, such as child, child abuse, child marriage, child labor, trafficking, and neglect. On the other hand, restrictions in movement and access to what services remain in the camps is curtailed not only because of the disease itself, but due to the community's adaptation measures uh, where they fear a lack of security and social norms, particularly affecting girls, are further restricting movements. The key challenges, so as I mentioned, the telecommunication ban has really curtailed our ability to shift to a remote intervention. It's very difficult to train, mentor, and support volunteers remotely without being able to contact them easily by mobile or, or through internet platforms. Information management for casework has also needed to be adapted as a lot of caseworkers are now uh, following up on casework from home. And finally, awareness raising and addressing misinformation and rumors, which are particularly challenging in the camps, are further complicated by our by limitations in communication.
Movement restrictions and restricted field access has also impacted the detection of cases in and of themselves. With less people in the field, there's less chance and opportunity to detect violence. There's also an inherent delay in responding adequately to cases. For organizations that haven't previously engaged in community-based case management, it's very difficult to transition to this modality at this stage, particularly in terms of training community volunteers and ensuring do no harm, especially keeping in mind the other challenges that I've just mentioned. And finally, staff vol and volunteer safety and care is difficult to balance with case management, given that case management is one-on-one -on -one service that requires privacy, usually in a closed space. So what are we doing to address these challenges? How are we adapting our case management? Again, as we've seen with other countries, we've reduced face-to-face -face visits for only urgent and complex cases, whether by caseworkers or whenever possible, and safely through volunteers. Anticipating a rise in unaccompanied and separated children or children in need of temporary care arrangements, we've updated a database of temporary alternative caregivers who are on standby and willing to host or foster children that might have been affected by COVID. We've also supported families to pre-identify what would their preferred alternative care modality be for their children temporarily should they need it. As mentioned as well, we've scaled up community-based case management by increasing the engagement of volunteers. This has included even volunteers that were not previously necessarily engaged in community-based case management, but that were engaged in other forms of community-based child protection. And finally, the case management technical working group has contextualized the guidance note on case management during COVID and has developed the remote case management guideline, which you can probably access in the link provided. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya. Thank you so much, Maya. Really a thought provoking presentation that highlights the exasperated child protection and mental health risks of vulnerable communities as a result of COVID and the restrictions imposed. Indeed, there is a critical need to continue its essential services, but doing so while ensuring access, safety, and quality and addressing the complex and the varying needs is also a challenge. So thank you so much for that. It looks like we have, we already have a lot of questions. Again, I see some people who are including their questions in the chat box, please ask your question in the Q&A space at the bottom of your screen. And while we collect questions for the field presenters, I'd like to take the opportunity to invite UNHCR colleague Clifford from UNHCR to answer a question and tell us a little bit about some of the specific considerations for child protection case management for refugee and asylum seeking children during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks, Lena. We have Amanda online and I invite Amanda to respond to the question. Please go ahead, Amanda. Welcome. Hello, thanks to everyone. This was really an inspiring presentation by the colleagues and thank you so much for all of your excellent and amazing work in really very difficult situation. I just wanted to say a few words about what we're seeing in terms of the impact of the current situation on refugee case management. First, one of the key things that we're seeing as UNHCR is really a substantial, as you will have all seen, restrictions on cross-border and internal movements, which is significantly impacting on the ability of refugees and IDPs to seek safety. We have, our, however, seen that it is possible to maintain access to safety with a significant number of countries demonstrating continued access to territories with some implementing 14-day quarantines. I mean, the second area we want to highlight is also in terms of protecting refugee children. It's extremely important that refugee children and their families continue to have access to registration and renewal of their asylum procedures. And while this has been significantly disrupted in many countries, we do see that in about a third of the countries, UNHCR and governments have been able to fully or partially maintain refugee registration procedures. This is particularly important for refugee case management because without access to those procedures, many children and families are not able to access the basic services, which as we've heard from many of our colleagues, 
are so crucial in order to prevent further exacerbation of the protection issues facing children. One of the things we heard that was really highlighted very clearly is, is the fact that many refugees and, and IDPs lived in very overcrowded and overcrowded settings with limited possibility of social distancing and limited access to health and wash services. I just wanted to also highlight and reiterate what was highlighted, I think, by all the presentations is how fundamental the increase in economic vulnerability is for the protection of children. We as UNHCR know that approximately 97% of refugees work in the informal sector and that sector has largely been brought to a halt. This has resulted in an exponential increase of protection risk for, for refugee children and other host community children as well as IDP, which we've heard so eloquently and disturbingly illustrated by all of our colleagues who have spoken. One thing that I would like to highlight that is a practical action that we as UNHCR are currently taking is that we are scaling up together with our partners access to cash assistance and we are currently working on a guidance note on how to integrate child protection and cash including how to integrate child protection within multi-sectorial cash as well as how to integrate cash in the context of the provision of best interest procedures and case management. So I think that may be of of help to colleagues in the field who are hopefully seeing the, the scale up of cash assistance to vulnerable populations. Lastly, just a few words on best interest procedures. We're very grateful for all the excellent work that our colleagues and partners have been doing in the field, in Lebanon, in Bangladesh, in many settings for adaption of the case management procedures and best interest procedures to the current situation. As UNHCR, we are advocating for and maintaining that critical child protection services are life-saving and must be maintained. This includes case management for high-risk cases, a shelter for victims of domestic violence, family-based alternative care and interim care centres. So we continue to work with our partners on the ground and throughout the through globally and in specific countries to really advocate that these services must be maintained and not only maintained, they must be scaled up as we've heard. So we really want to just highlight a couple of key advocacy points from our side. We do continue to advocate for the exception of movement restrictions to allow family members to move to travel for children and for families to be reunited. That advocacy for best interest procedures and case management alternative care and shelters should be designated as core services and maintained. And we've heard excellent work at the technical level of colleagues doing coordinating and developing common interagency approaches for the adaption of best interest procedures in refugee settings. It's really important the coordination with health providers and other course providers because we know they may be the one of the few entry points for children and their families to disclose domestic violence. So it's extremely important. We work very closely with our health colleagues to strengthen and reinforce the identification and referral of child protection cases from the health sector. And then as we've heard, you know, really continuing to provide that online support and supervision to the caseworkers who are doing incredible work under very difficult circumstances. Linking to core services, including cash assistance, and finally, as we heard in, an, I, I think it was in Lebanon, that it's really important that, that we continue to advocate with all, all actors that refugees, IDPs and other children affected by this situation should all have non-discriminatory access to child protection and, and other basic services. So thank you very much. We're really interested to hear some and, and participate in the, in the rest of the webinar. Over to you, Zainab. Thank you so much, Amanda. It really is disheartening how even the most basic of needs and safety measures are not even possible in refugee settings, IDP settings as well, and for migrant children and families. But really heartened by your work and all humanitarian agencies who are constantly advocating for ensuring that these considerations are built into our guidance um, and our operations that aim to continue essential child protection case management services. So thank you so much, Amanda. Now on to some questions for our field presenters. Um, and the first question is for you, Rita. With remote case management, do you record the interviews, for example, through audio or video for accountability purposes? And how can we address the issue of consent and assent in remote assessments. 
Thank you, Zainab. Basically, the phone calls that are done through WhatsApp, they're of course recorded or even by phone. And every single counseling session that happens, everything is put in writing. Of course, we continue doing case audits and we continue following on the quality of, of the case management that is happening. Of course, it goes without saying, we fully trust the partners, but also sometimes misunderstandings happen. So it's very important to keep records and notes of everything that is being said. Coming to the consent, the cases that we already know, that we have been already in touch with them for the past few months. So basically there is consent to continue working together, but we take again a particular consent asking verbally the child and the caregiver if it is possible to conduct the counseling. And we explain the purpose again and again. As I mentioned, there's already trust established with the families. However, the challenge that we are facing is with the new families and the new identified cases, which building trust is not happening very quickly. And particularly that sometimes face-to-face -face is not necessarily happening. We try to use FaceTime, but this is a challenge that we need to overcome. On another note, I believe it's very important to mention that we have been also trying to reach out to local authorities and municipalities to allow us to access children and particular groups because particularly during these circumstances, we really need authorities to be on our side instead of pushing us back. And so far, because everyone is also very much afraid from COVID, whenever you mention that you're doing humanitarian work, they're not putting additional restrictions, but they're just giving you some guidelines to keep yourselves and the people around you safe. One question that was also asked, if I could answer online as well, if there were particular communication related challenges with certain groups, we have the deaf and mute group. We try to communicate with their parents and a few of us know sign language, I know it. So we try to help each other as, as much as we can. And also it's particularly challenging to have um, a phone conversations with children who are below five years old. So we are trying as well to have some FaceTime whenever it's possible. For some cases, we're considering charging their internet uh, bundles uh, online. And we are, instead of having one session, we're having more than one counseling in order to establish the trust. Yes, thank you. That was perfect, Rita. The, the second question is for Thomas. So the question is really about how do you build trust with survivors? And here I'm assuming it's survivors of violence, including gender-based violence, as we work remotely. How do survivors disclose their cases easily to caseworkers or a person they trust? Mm, thank you very much. So far, since our locations have not a telephone service in most of our locations, we are managing such kind of issues on face-to-face -face contact with survivors as well as our beneficiaries. Our case workers are accessible currently at the community level. They visit the cases with a high protection concern. We have already provided for the case workers this uh, PPE to protect themselves as well as protect the clients. Whenever they got any referral from the community side or uh, any information, they, they are traveling. So far, we have not managing the remote support due to connectivity issue in that issue. Thank you so much, Thomas. The next question is for you, Maya. And the question is about volunteers and community engagement. So how are you engaging volunteers and communities in your community-based mechanism that you described in your presentation, especially given the current COVID context? Thank you very much. Indeed, it's a challenging task. The advantage that we had in the response is that the response in general relied on community-based child protection significantly, even before the outbreak. So we started by mapping our community capacity. And in the time that we had where we could be present in the field, we spent that time engaging community volunteers and training them on very basic interventions and key messages that they could deliver. So for instance, we are relying on community volunteers for following up on medium to low risk cases and effecting referrals whenever possible, and just informing us of the need to interfere in person for high-risk cases. Thank you so much, Maya. And I think we have time for just one more question. And the question is actually to you, Maya, as well. How do you identify new cases during COVID-19 and how do you make your assessment? Is it hard through the phone or is there any good practice from your specific context for conducting an assessment over the phone? This is a very good question as it's a current uh, challenge that's under discussion, at least for TDH internally, on ensuring that we maintain detection capacity. 
Again, as I've mentioned, our community volunteers, they're trained on safe identification and referral, even the ones that weren't necessarily engaged on community-based case management. They still had that capacity and played that role and continue to do so. The way that they communicate back with us is that each community volunteer has been paired with a caseworker and as much as possible, we are trying to communicate with the volunteers by phone. When that's not possible, because currently we still have access to the camps, the caseworkers are able to go into the field and hold debrief sessions with the volunteers. I think another aspect that would need to be explored further is not to forget the role that other sectors play in the detection, especially right now with health actors scaling up their interventions and a lot of health frontliners entering the camps. We need to make sure that these individuals, that the connections are there. We've already updated the referral pathways, the communication channels are there, but we need to ensure that the detection capacity doesn't just stop in child protection, that it also exists within the other sectors and continues to be scaled up. Thank you so much, Maya. And um, I do apologize that we need to move on to the next segment. There's so many important questions that we want to answer them all. Luckily, this is the first in a series of webinars, so hopefully we will have opportunity to engage in a way that you find is meaningful. Really wonderful presentations and an enticing dialogue. It is really these field experiences and exchange around the challenges and lessons learned that inform the guidance and the best practice for our sector. So this is a great segue to introduce to you the case management task force members who are forces of nature and did a heavy lift with the development of the COVID-19 Child Protection Case Management Guidance. Colleen, Caroline, Lourdes, over to you for a quick introduction and your presentation. Over to you, ladies. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Zainab. And thank you everyone for joining us today. It's really exciting to see over 600 people who are also so enthusiastic about this topic and wanting to exchange. Thanks to all of our field colleagues for your fantastic presentations. We're here as the, the case management task force members to present to everyone on the call this new global case management guidance note, which we really wanted to develop collaboratively in order to provide guidance to colleagues in the field who've been working and trying to adapt case management to these very challenging circumstances. So as things were progressing with the response through March and over the course of April, we've seen colleagues from different countries, as has been mentioned, developing these excellent guidance notes from Iraq, from Lebanon, from Bangladesh. We saw colleagues coming together and developing interagency guidance. And what we did is there were many organizations who were also developing individual guidance for their separate agencies. So we decided to come together as the case management task force and build on all of those resources that were being developed in order to create global interagency guidance to hopefully support colleagues. So we came together, particularly as SAVE, TDH, and PLAN, in order to develop this guidance note, which is developed around a tool that we have under the case management task force, which is called the quality assessment framework. And it was a tool that was developed back in 2018 that helps us to look at the core components of a case management system in order to really understand the quality of the system. And the tool itself that has been developed, this guidance note, we've ensured that it's also aligned with the other interagency documents that have been mentioned under the Alliance, including that on alternative care, on supporting the workforce and community level child protection. As I mentioned, this guidance note is structured in the same way as the quality assessment framework. So we have these eight core components of a case management system. So under each one of these categories, we have key actions that are recommended. And so that includes the broader case management response, the case management process for new cases and also ongoing cases, strengthening the system, collaboration and coordination, staffing and capacity building, sufficient resources, information management, and finally monitoring, evaluation, accountability, and learning. And I'm going to actually hand it over to my colleagues, Caroline from SAVE and Lourdes from TDH, to share a bit more about the specific guidance in each of these eight sections. Thanks, Colleen. This is Lourdes Carrasco from TDH. And as, as Colleen said, we are we're going to present a very quick snapshot of what we can find in the guidance. So we are not going to go into details of what it is uh, and all the content inside. 
but as uh, Colin was explaining, is the core component. So what we were aiming is that it represents all the different components and the priority actions to adopt case management under the current context of uh, COVID-19. So I'm going to present a few of them. And, and as, again, uh, it's a very quick uh, snapshot of it. So we, you will find and we will refer to further resources and details that you can find in the guidance, but it's mainly to guide you through it. So what uh, the first core component in case management response, what do we mean, what the guidance explains, or uh, what the guidance is in, in uh, in how do we adapt the case management response. So we focus on target group reviewing eligibility criteria, caseload. What does it mean? Since, as Colleen said, is what do we do with this? How do we review our current caseload and allocation of risks as they might change? For this, the guidance do present a few guiding questions and then a, a review on suggestions for high, medium, and low risk. So even if we prioritize on high risk, and it's also to take everything into account. And then not only the current caseload, but also how do we deal and monitor our capacity for new caseload generated by the directly or indirectly by the COVID-19. So what the guidance presents, it's also, of course, a link to the Alliance Technical Note, which goes much more in detail on the child protection risks related to COVID, but also provides a fit summary of child protection risks and concerns that can be directly and indirectly generated by the pandemic, and a few examples on protocols on how could we review and how could we establish these clear protocols for new case loads that we might have. And then on the, on the first part of the response also, the guidance would provide thinking about modalities. How do we review, we have reviewed with whom and our target groups and caseloads. So then what is our modality of work? It's uh, of course, as we all discuss on remote or face-to-face. -face. So the guidance just provides hints on, depending on the context, on capacities and on the materials available, is how, how and when can we provide face-to-face -face support and how and when remote and when we come to remote support or face-to-face -face is also exactly on the, the way we can provide it and uh, when can we decide that. For this, the guidance relies on what was some of the support resources that are included are the resources developed in Lebanon or related to remote phone follow-up or to social distancing and safety measures in, in, in visit, in, during visits. And then also some single agency examples for on how to decide if uh, when we go about face-to-face -face or remote. So all this is, can be found there. If we go to the second part in the process, uh, just a very key guidance that provides the document is that the case management process remains unchanged. The case management process and the steps do not change for every emergency, but of course, they, in this current context, they will have to be adapted. Uh, and it's the modality and the approach that uh, changes, but it's not the case management process and steps per se which changes. The guidance what provides is key recommendations on what our priorities in adapting this process and a part one main issue would be adapting a, a principled interaction and communication with children and families as we know it might be key when we have very limited interaction or remote interaction so it provides some suggestions and and resources on messages on that we can use for this principled and adapted interaction with families and children also including some uh, mental health and psychosocial support resources that can be integrated and adapted and used by uh, case management teams and then, of course, for a principal process, uh, we will require to think about when we adapt modalities, and some questions have been directed on that, uh, uh, on that uh, direction, it's uh, safe documentation and record keeping, which would be uh, explained further when we talk about information management for case management, more in deep, but it's part of the safeguarding uh, processes that we need to take into account. Again, repeating that all the guidance provides these key priority actions and is for us to be all on the same page with the different uh, priorities, but more in deep resources to provide detailed information. When it comes to strengthening child protection system, what the guidance presents is uh, some priority actions that case child protection case management um, can do to strengthen the system within this context. And it's actually very, uh, some essential uh, actions as uh, promoting links between health and social services at national and subnational levels 
but also an advocacy for social service workforce and child protection, humanitarian child protection case management services to be considered life-saving and a vital part of the COVID-19 response. If advocating for these essential services would also mean to advocate for appropriate protection measures for frontline workers. And uh, of course, advocating for these essential services would also lead to coordinate and support for the integration of child protection case management services within health units and services and establishing protocols to ensure that child protection concerns are responded to. And, uh, but also coordinating and supporting provision of with the social protection services schemes and mechanisms existing as some uh, comments have been done on that direction on to provide support to the economically vulnerable households that have been affected by the pandemic, but may, and also by the consequent measures on quarantine, uh, restriction of women, etc. Regarding collaboration coordination, which is an, uh, another core component of, the, of any case management intervention, the guidance uh, provides some priority actions at different levels of coordination. So interagency coordination, meaning uh, the guidance provides some this division of within the child protection sector and with government, what are our key priorities on distributing caseload, on uh, joint messaging and dissemination, but then also other key priorities related to how do we on other sectors coordination, which is linked with the advocacy uh, messages and resources that I forgot to say that they are also included in the strengthening child protection system, some alliance resources on, on joint messages. And uh, of course, another key component within collaboration, which is the community collaboration and engagement. And as, as many of our colleagues have explained already very well, but in the guidance, what uh, it's included is also this uh, finding this balance into strengthening and scaling up the, the, the community-based uh, services, support and collaboration but at the same time keep ensuring the safety of children, families and the community-based focal points and volunteers. Uh, and of course, also without compromising confidentiality. So the guidance provides some suggestions as to find this balance, very clear roles and responsibilities for uh, within this collaboration must be established. So the guidance provides some suggestions on these roles and responsibilities and for the resources that can be explored on these roles or community roles. And, but not least, of course, in coordination, all this is involved by the priority of updating service mapping and referral pathways, as all the different colleagues have explained that it was one of the actions already taken. And the guidance what it provides also is how to, uh, is how this uh, review of uh, service mapping and referral pathways have to be done involving and informing all these different layer levels of coordination. So at uh, child protection and other sectors, interagency coordination, but also with community based uh, services, focal points and volunteers. And uh, the guidance also provides some examples of interagency tools on service mapping and referral pathways that can help to adapt to adapt to in a faster way uh, for different uh, field teams. So I'm going to pass uh, the word to Caroline for the rest. Yes, hello everybody. My name is Caroline. Uh, I work for, uh, for Save the Children. Um, so if we go to the next section, which is about staff well-being, uh, I think it has already been said several times that health safety well-being of case management teams should be a top priority so infection prevention and control protocols should be in place and the guidance also basically advises to make sure to advocate for personal protection equipment for case workers as well as community volunteers um, whom you might decide to work with in in this pandemic the guidance includes considerations around remote supervision and coaching and it was really nice to listen to the work on that, the, the remote coaching also that's being done in Lebanon. The guidance talks about peer-to-peer -peer supervision for caseworkers, for example, working in the same location. And we also included a hyperlink to an interesting guidance from IFRC, which includes tips on both in-person, but also remote individual group and peer-to-peer -peer supervision. 
Then capacity building, when developing your capacity building plan, it would be good to consider training case management staff, which should always include community volunteers on COVID-19, these IPC measures and the protection equipment on how to identify protection risks and vulnerabilities in light of COVID on remote support approaches, amongst others. And I think it was really interesting to scroll through the different questions. There are quite a lot of them on, on capacity building, making available training materials. So so I think this is a nice ask for CPA, YU and HER and the Case Management Task Force to try to gather different training materials that have already been develop developed and then making that uh, available maybe as annex to, uh, to this guidance. Um, so the next section about financial resources, we basically listed a range of items that you might want to consider procuring, uh, which again includes um, the, the protection equipment, um, but also appropriate devices for distant case management support and supervision. So think of phones, smartphones, credit batteries, solar panels, um, as well as ac access to online platforms such as Skype, Zoom, Teams, GoToMeeting, where appropriate, where there is um, a proper internet connection. You might also want to think about cash and voucher assistance, and that is if markets and services are still functional, or consider giving caseworkers access to an emergency case management fund, in particular if they cannot access the office. And this uh, need is likely to increase as services become more overwhelmed or restricted for children and their families. Then the section um, on information management, uh, so some, some key tips that we included in this section. Think of simplifying case management forms if information is to be collected by phone or uh, by identified uh, and trained community members. Think of reviewing your information sharing processes. Make sure that they are clear, simple to all actors, including health workers that are involved in the process and prioritize the confidentiality of the information that's being shared. And then lastly, Primero and CPIMS Plus can support remote child protection case management service provision, maintaining data protection and privacy, as well as supporting remote supervision and additional guidance for countries who are using CPIMS Plus will soon come out. So this was basically a quick snapshot of what the guidance includes. And again, when looking at all the questions, I think maybe it's good to say that the guidance includes um, like key considerations that will get you going if, if you are on in relation to different components that you are working on. Basically, this webinar will give us better insight in the issues and challenges that you are facing in the field, and it will then be up to us to gather that and to identify those areas where we would want to develop further guidance, which we can then annex uh, to, the, to the guidance. Over to you, Colleen. Great. Thank you so much. So as I think most of you saw, we posted the link to the guidance in the chat. Please go there and, and download the guidance. And Zainab, it would be great if you can share with the group around what the feedback mechanism will be in order that we can continue engaging on this. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you so much, Colleen, Lourdes, Caroline. You know, it's really wonderful to hear, you know, the full orientation of the guidance. As many of you know, and hopefully the participants can really realize that this guidance came as a direct response to field requests, asking for something that's a bit more operational to help in adapting case, child protection case management services in the COVID response with attention to continuity of services, but also new services and support to new cases to meet the emerging child protection needs during COVID. So thank you so much. And now on to some questions to you from our participants. So the first question is, I'm interested in knowing if you have any standard operating procedures or advice on carrying out a best interest determination panel review remotely. I think the question is whether or not this information is included in the guidance. We are exploring the possibility of carrying out remote best interest determinations, case management panels, and would like some guidance on this. So that is not entailed in the guidance document itself. I think this is a very important question and I'm looking to our colleagues, Cliff and Amanda, if you wanna jump in on that. Thanks so much, Colleen. Yes, in fact, we do have in our upcoming uh, BID guidelines, BIP guidelines uh, best interest procedure guidelines, we do have some examples of remote 
um, best interest uh, determination panels and we'd be happy to provide that um, to colleagues. So feel free to be in contact with us. If you just put your name and email address in the chat, then we will be, we will be in contact with you directly and we'll also make you available our um, community of practice where these kind of questions can be answered for everybody. Thank you so much, Amanda. And I think it's important to note that the guidance is meant to be a living document and there will be a field testing period that follows today. So we will invite all of you to provide feedback through a dedicated feedback form to really better understand some of these gaps in resources, gaps in guidance. We will do our best to refer to guidance within this, including the one that is being developed by UNHCR and so on. So your feedback really is essential in helping to shape this guidance to better meet your needs. Moving on to another question. I appreciate what you are saying, but how are you addressing child protection cases for those with intellectual disabilities and communication disabilities? I am asking this because in our communities in Africa, TVs and radios are not everywhere and helping such children requires some sort of specialty. Very difficult questions. <laughs> Over to you. Caroline, I'd like to um, request that you field this question. I know that Save the Children has been thinking specifically about children with disabilities. And I, I hope that we can hyperlink the guidance and, and there, there are also top tips on working with children with disabilities. And I think throughout the different sections, we already try to address the specific needs of children with disabilities. I think it starts with trying to identify organizations organizations who are led by children with disabilities uh, or who are addressing the needs of children with disabilities and try to involve them in the work in the community and also to get their advice on how to make sure that their specific needs are being addressed as part of the case management process. Maybe what we can we can promise is that we will we will share f further uh, links um, and, and resources uh, on this. Thank you, Caroline. And we have time for just one more question. And so the question is from Marie from Warchild. She asks, any guidance on how to maintain confidentiality and how to adapt data protection protocols for remote case management with COVID-19 restrictions in place? Sure, we know that confidentiality is a very substantial concern, especially with remote case management. As we said, you know, case management still needs to abide by the same guidelines, and we know that protecting children's information is of the utmost importance, and that in fact, with more online activities happening, children become more vulnerable. So ensuring confidentiality is, is certainly very important. So in the guidance that we've developed, we've tried to be very clear that children's names and bio data, if caseworkers are doing documentation, should not be in the documentation. We need to really try to protect their identity as much as possible. So we have to try to strike this balance if there is not a, an un online system for documentation. So that's for for using paper form still. It is still important to do documentation so we can have a record of what's happening with cases. So I think it's the sensitive balance of being able to ensure that we've documented what's occurring with the case, but also protecting children's personal information. I also think this is a, an opportune moment to mention the CPIMS Plus and Progress version four. Um, Gassian, I'm wondering if you wanna pop in really quickly around the work that you've been doing on the CPIMS Plus side. Thanks, Colin. Yes, so we've been supporting like, all the countries that are currently using CPIMS Plus to ensure that they can continue using their system and uh, using uh, CPIMS Plus while supporting uh, children through case management. So the use of the system right now in those countries have been useful for those case manager and case worker and also supervisor to support remote supervision and, uh, and ensure confidentiality of the cases. So with the use of the system, they can access to their cases on their mobile phone or on their computer, ensuring data protection and making sure that there is no other people that can access to those cases. So we are making sure that those countries that are currently using CPIMS Plus can continue using it and maybe adjust also the list of protection categories categories to the need of their response. So we are making some adju adjustments in uh, the country that needs to respond a lot on cases that are related
related to COVID-19. So, and then the use of those data could be eventually be used for advocacy. So we are also sharing those information on data of not specific children, but just overall data to ensure uh, advocacy and implementing also new projects in the future. So those data can also be used for advocacy purpose eventually. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gessian. And I'm very conscious of the time. I want to respect everyone's availability. I do not want to ignore any of the really important questions that are coming through. Lots on mental health and psychosocial support as well. Within the guidance, there is reference to a UNICEF MHPSS guidance operation guidance on adapting and implementing MHPSS within COVID response. Um, so we will share the link to that as well, um, includes really clear recommendations across a, and utilizing the socio-ecological model to establish different types of activities at different levels of intervention and really how you go about in adapting both to remote types of activities, but also other modalities where physical distancing is not possible or where there is a requirement to provide in-person and face-to-face -face support. So we will be able to share that with you as well. Moving on to the final segment and a live poll to establish with you a set of priority topics linked to child protection case management in COVID. We really need your support in helping us establish what these priority topics are and understand the modalities for addressing them with you and, and to really, uh, in a way that really best meets your needs um, and in a way that ensures access accessibility and efficiency. You probably see the poll has come up on your screens. The first question is, please prioritize what topics you would like to prioritize in future sessions or annexes to this guidance. It is multiple choice, and of course, you can choose more than one response. Great, thank you so much. And it looks like remote case management through mobile phones and digital platforms is coming up as a very critical priority, including remote supervision um, and community level case management. Great, so we have closed the first poll. A second poll question should be coming up on your screens. And the question is in the future, I prefer to engage in case management sessions through yeah. attending a webinar like this one, listening to a podcast, joining a Facebook live stream, engaging with other colleagues in a chat forum, receiving guidance note like the case management guidance that was provided more information on to you today, or receiving guidance notes from other countries. And it's good to see that 91% 91, 91 of you have already voted for attending a webinar, which I hope means that you've all enjoyed the webinar today and that it was helpful. The poll has closed. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. This is really important information for us. With two minutes on the clock, we're so happy that we were, we made good time, I think. <laughs> we will, as mentioned, send you all the relevant links after this event, including the link to the webinar recording and the COVID-19 child protection case management guidance with the feedback form where we hope to really get your feedback on what we're missing, how this guidance note can better meet your needs. I'm so really grateful for your time and attention to this feedback process to really kind of help us in delivering our role and supporting you. I do also want to mention that the child protection area of responsibility is also creating a child protection in COVID-19 forum. We will also send you the link in the email that follows. This is going to be a really wonderful forum to facilitate learning and facilitate field level exchange between the different countries between different practitioners to really kind of solidify and strengthen practitioner to practitioner support. So we will also provide more information to you on this in a follow-up email. Thank you so much for participating in today's webinar. We hope everyone is staying safe and finding ways to support each other in these very trying times and we hope to see you again next time. Mm -hmm.